Hello and welcome to our latest um, virtual bridge session. And, and as Drew just pointed out, yes, two days after the September 23rd deadline for public sector bodies um, accessibility regulations. So I'm, I'm intrigued to hear how University of Glasgow has been getting along, <laughs> creating that aura of harmonization and accessibility, or, or, or harmonization of accessibility and usability at the university. So without further ado, Drew, over to you. Thank you, Kenji. Um, <clears throat> so we've been looking at this for about 18 months now, just slightly longer than that, um, when we found out about the new regulations. And the, the, the approach that we've taken, though, is not to try so much. I mean, you have to do it, but not try so much and cover the WCAG 2.1 AA checklists, but to approach it as if it's, it's an attitude towards accessibility and inclusivity. And that's why we're using this, this language here, uh, the harmonization of accessibility and uh, usability. Um, and look, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, right? It's, Except insofar as what I've been doing for the last 18 months and what I've learned and what my experiences are. And so I probably have read one more paper than some of you and less papers than some of you, some of the others. It's taken up a large part of my working life for the last 18 months, though, I would say. Uh, my background is in, is in web and I've, I've been very interested in usability or as it's somewhat ironically known now as, as UX. And so, of course, the, the digital accessibility fits quite nicely into that because it's almost almost the same thing. Um, I've had digital accessibility in my job description since at least 2007. So for those of you um, that don't know, and I would be surprised if there's any like that, um, these regulations came into UK law in 2018. Um, there's two main sort of facets of it. And the way we approached this was yeah, the accessibility statements for the platforms and the content that's on those platforms. And of course, and we kept that as two separate work streams. Of course, it's not that way. You can't really have one without the other, but really that's, that's, that's how we approached it. And it helps to, it helps to um, well, it helped me to, to, to think about it a little bit more clearly. Um, <clears throat> this of course develops the, the existing legal requirements from the Equality Act of 2010. And those, those actually still apply where you've got to make um, a reasonable adjustment. So when I found, I found out about this, uh, probably it was after the, 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 it came into UK law about uh, November 2018. And I wrote a paper, a briefing paper. And uh, I'm never doing that again, let me tell you. Um, because that briefing paper went all around the university. And, uh, um, and I think what's quite interesting here about this digital accessibility is the University of Glasgow took this legislation very seriously indeed, right up to the top of the management of the university. So when these people read my um, the briefing paper, the, the Deputy Secretary of Court, which is the, you know, the second person in the uni from the administration, um, formed a working group. And not to be outdone, the, um, the, the uh, Vice Principal for Learning and Teaching also formed an academic working group. So, you know, why have one working group when you can have two as a university after all? So, um, out of that, I've also formed the Information Services Action Group. You see what I did there? You see what I did there? Um, and as I said, we, we, we kind of split it into platforms and content. So, the timeline for accessibility statements is there. I'm not going to read it out. And of course, you all know that um, there was another deadline there just two days ago. Um, in the first year, we had five of our systems that were in school. That is five systems that had been updated between 2018 and 2019. And it was very interesting. We learned quite a lot of things about um, um, developers just in that time. Um, we learned that developers didn't really have uh, usability built into their toolkit that much. They, they, not very many of them knew how to do the WCAG tests. Um, computing science doesn't seem to have this as part of the curriculum, and that's something that maybe we should all be looking at. Um, but 
to their credit, they built it into their, uh, we have a, a process here called a personal development review. I'm sure you've all got something similar, everybody hates it. Um, but they built that in and training to uh, get themselves up to speed with some of this stuff um, over the last year. Um, so that was good. We did publish the five statements on time and, and I think they're, they're pretty good. Room for improvement, obviously. Um, so this year we have currently published 23 accessibility statements. We decided everything was in scope, by the way. All our, all our online platforms, everything needs an accessibility statement. We've still got some that are a little bit um, tardy, shall we say, um, and we're expecting them, but they've they started to come in, we just haven't had time to put them up. And uh, I think by this time next week, they'll be closer to 30 statements there. So that's uh, pretty good going. Of course, we've got um, mobile apps need to have the statements for next year. So that's uh, something to look forward to. Um, so as I said, we split it up. We've got the, the content here and Tam. Um, the content also has to uh, meet the accessibility standards. And I think what was really different about this, this stuff was is that, that specifically um, these regulations was specifically spoke about VLEs, uh, other kinds of documents, office documents, PDF type documents, anything that's going to be used on the web. And that was, that was something, I mean, I've been, I've been using, putting accessible things on the web for a long, long time. But I didn't really think about VLEs and, and Word documents and all of that, and I don't think anybody else has. I mean, who who put uh, an old text on their, their PowerPoint slide images? Certainly, certainly not me, uh, although I think you'll find that this presentation does have old text on the, the few images that I've used. Um, so the audio and video also came into scope on the 23rd of September and that's that's um, I'll, I'll circle back to this a little bit that's that's the thing that's causing a great deal of uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth around here um, so what did we do so we moved into action we have had several long-running communications plans in fact the the one that we did this year is the most complex communication plan I've ever did in my life. Um, the SRC, that's our, sorry, that's our Students' Representative Council, um, produced a video on why all this was important this year. Um, we created an accessibility statement for those, those guys that needed them based on the, the Government Digital Service Guidelines. Um, we engaged with third party providers. There's something very interesting happened with third party providers actually. So initially, especially last year, not so much this year, last year they were all uh, somewhat resistant to having to engage with this because they felt that they weren't public sector body and so therefore they didn't have to. Um, and I had several meetings with them and, and, and a couple of them actually to their credit did a complete 180. In fact, one of them in particular said that we are now going to make ourselves accessibility first. Um, because I think they've seen, a, seen a, a market advantage to that because I, I began to point out to them that they might not be having to be compliant, but we do, and we therefore won't be able to use your service. But even more, and this is what really brought it home to them, procurement couldn't be using those systems. Um, so they, they all kind of changed their tune. We also got uh, Blackboard Ally, and that went live on August the 1st. And um, that's, that's a really useful tool, and I'll come back and talk about that later. Um, the comms, a lot of the comms we've had to do this year was really about calming people down. Um, something really interesting has happened at Glasgow and I will come back to that as well, but people took it really on board, especially with the, you know, the shifting online. I don't know how, if that's helped or not because this has just become part of that and it's created a great deal of anxiety. There was also, there's a great deal of anxiety about the shifting online anyway. Um, but this is also added to that. So a lot of our comms were about, look, we're looking for improvement over time. This is a journey, all of that kind of stuff, rather than about making everything accessible all at once. Um, so we built a website um, as a public service to the university, and we've used uh, Sculpt, which is from Helen Wilson. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It's, it's pretty good, and it's a great place to get people started and engaged. And SCULP stands for, oh dear, put myself on the spot now, aren't I? It's, well, it says it there. Whew. Structure, colour and contrast, use of images, links, plain English, which is not actually part of the digital accessibility regulations, but I think it's 
should be, <laughs> perhaps, uh, in table structure. Uh, we, we, we've also um, added to that because I felt that it wasn't quite covering everything that needed to for a, for a university. And uh, we call it Sculpt Plus, uh, and which is uh, use of videos, forms, and exempt types of content. Um, if actually, if we could get forms to start with an R, we could have sculpture. So uh, group read and see if you can do that. Nobody else has been able to, so there's a challenge for you. Um, so Blackboard Ally, so we bought Blackboard Ally after seeing it at a GIST conference in uh, March, which was the, the last time I was allowed out um, and uh, in Birmingham. And they showed it to me and they showed me the um, alternative formats. And I probably should have mentioned alternative, having to provide alternative formats for stuff is one of the main stays of the new regulations. Um, so that's that's obviously going to be quite challenging, and we were we were wondering about how we were going to do that because you know how would we even manage that if somebody was in Moodle, which is our VLE, needed an alternative format? How were we going to? How's that going to get? Who does it? So we didn't we didn't really know. So when we saw what Blackboard Ally did, in fact they showed me the alternative format thing, and then they were going to show me the the, the accessibility check, and I said no, it's okay. We're we're having this because because of that's so powerful. Um, so it looks a looks a little bit like that. Um, when it's this is a, this is from our Moodle, and um, when you upload documents, it does a certain amount of uh, Moodle stuff as well. And uh, this is a this is a, a staff member's view, so the the students don't see the little uh, a gauge; they just see the A with the down arrow. It's, it's all very well labelled as well, by the way, for people that are uh, um, may have difficulty identifying the colours. Um, so you can see there, this is a test site, and you can see there, there's some stuff that, that, that needs some work. And uh, the way that it works, and I, I'm not going to show you this today, but the way that it works is the, the, the staff member clicks on that little icon, it opens up in the side window, tells them what's wrong with it, tells them what to do, tells them why they need to do it. It's really good, it's pretty educational. Um, for students uh, and staff as well, the alternative formats, that little A, and it downloads things in a, a number of formats. Uh, for example, we've got um, EPUBs, uh, tag PDFs, MP3, and you haven't lived until you've converted your PowerPoint presentation to an MP3, let me tell you. Um, uh, digital Braille, uh, and a couple of other things. Um, so, we feel that that covers most of our requests for alternative formats and we're providing it in a sort of a self-service kind of a way. Um, we're also uh, providing an accessibility checker within the VLE for our academics, so to make their lives a little bit easier in terms of, in terms of that. So that's all good. So we've got a, I've got a screenshot of our, we put this in place on the 1st of August and um, this is the, this is the overview of where we're at with it. So you can see the, the 13,570 is the number of courses that we have in Moodle. Uh, 304,000 number is the amount of content that's been checked by Blackboard Ally. And the 80.1% is the accessibility score. And I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to people that most of the issues are around, well, sculpt, structure, contrast, use of links, um, not putting alt tags, alt text on, on images. Uh, it's, it's not really surprising. There's a bunch of other things. There's a lot of us. We have some issues with scanned PDFs that we're going to have to um, circle back to and look at how we can we can make that better. Um, but you see the 80.1% um, is 20% um, up on this period last year. So that's sort of interesting. And do um, you remember the website? So. That's the Google Analytics for the website over, not the same period, that starts in July. So I wanted to show you what it was doing in July. So that's the, the this, this activity in July is between uh, zero and 70 page hits. And then it goes up to about 200 a day during August. And then you can see there, it really, that's, that's an increase of over 100%. It really goes up in September as well. And these peaks here are actually, when we did comms. Um, so um, one of the ways I measure comms is when I send an email out, I'll have a link back to a website. I'll try and keep the comms as, as simple as possible and uh, entice people to find out more at the website so we can then see how many people are actually 
uh, engaging with it. So you can see there's, you can see something's happening. And if you go back to the, the previous slide with that 20% increase, that appears like something's working here. It appears that people are going on to the digital accessibility website and applying some of the, 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 the guidance that's on there for me, um, which no one's more surprised about that than me, let me tell you. Okay, so audio and video. So that's came into uh, force on the 23rd of September, two days ago, and that's the actual WCAG uh, success criteria for video. There's others as well, but this is the one I've picked to, to, to read to you. Uh, and I'm going to read it out, sorry. An alternative for time-based media or audio description of the pre-recorded video content is provided for synchronized media, except when the media is a media alternative for text and is clearly labeled as such. So that's a sort of rough translation of that. And this is what we've been transmitting to, to our academics. Um, and we've decided here that what we will do is, um, and I think is in the next slide actually, is provide um, transcripts, auto transcripts for everything and leave it to the colleges and schools as to where they want to go in terms of um, making improvements for that. I have to say that we're probably not as far ahead there as perhaps I would like to be, but certainly we've made the start. And there's been a great deal of focus on the content this year, perhaps because of Blackboard Ally. And you know, I'm I'm happy enough with that because everything's moving in the correct direction. You can see we've got a 20% increase in accessibility of the content in Moodle this year. And um, we are providing auto transcripts. We are going to have to circle back and look at some of that. Um, there's some exemptions here, and, and, and this number two here is, is actually sort of interesting, I think, because if it's if the media is replicating or summarizing existing text, so if you've got handouts, lecture notes, or a script, um, and it doesn't have any more information than the text, then it doesn't need a transcript, it needs to be labeled as such. Though. And media published before, and <laughs> there's been a lot of discussion in some of the forums about what constitutes publishing as well. Um, but I think that, that that question is going to go away as we move forward in time. Anything published from Wednesday needs to have either a transcript or closed caption. Well, it's actually, it needs to have an alternative format, actually. And of course, live video less than 14 days old is exempt, but the government digital service advice is that if you're going to publish that, it really should have something on it as soon as you can possibly make it. It's not like a, a loophole for you to put something up for 14 days. So as I said uh, before, I kind of jumped the gun. Um, this is the three services that we've got, the, the central services, information services are providing um, automatic transcripts for. That's uh, Zoom, Microsoft Stream, and Echo 360. The quality of those transcripts, depending on who you believe, is uh, between 75 and 90%. Um, in my experience, it's a great deal worse than that. Um, so I'm not quite sure. I, 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 I'm expecting the technology to improve, although that's really my fingers crossed rather than anything else. And there's things that we can do to mitigate it, but there's, there's, there's all sorts of issues around some of this stuff in terms of um, the way that some, uh, some things are taught. Um, so for example, Gaelic, or Gaelic is the, I shouldn't say Gaelic, um, Gaelic um, is difficult because there's no translator for that. Uh, Latin, ancient Greek, all these things are difficult. The way that modern languages are taught in pedagogy are, are, is challenging because they, don't, they sometimes don't want the students to see it written down. They want them to hear it a few times first before they see it written down. And, and as a matter of fact, our, um, our uh, College of Arts, uh, well, elements of our College of Arts are looking at uh, applying a disproportionate burden um, on Spanish um, because they can, well, there isn't a translator that will do it, that will translate two languages and some of the class is delivered in English and some of it's delivered in Spanish. Um, and they will provide a transcript for the English parts of the class and notes for the Spanish part of the class. And if anybody also requires it, they will of course get that, you know, they will do a transcript for that. Um, so that's that's sort of interesting and that's the first disproportionate burden we've claimed so you know the certain criteria that you have to meet there so we're kind of looking at that and we're actually in, we're not even sure how we can get those approved or anything like that i mean who who the the, the, the chap's writing it but what, <laughs> who says it's okay so that's 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 something that we're going to need to, to try and figure out here um 
one of the things that we've done with this though is, is um, because of the flip to online learning, there's been a great deal of um, pedagogy advice here about how that might work. And what we've done is we've embedded the end-to-end -end processes of using these services from start to finish, you know, how you go about setting up a meeting, scheduling it in Moodle, adding the transcript. We've, we've just embedded that into the process just as business as usual. It's just part of the thing. It's something that you do as you're moving this stuff forward. So that's been that's been quite a, a good thing. And really that's where we need to get to here is, is how do we embed all this as business as usual now. And that's that's where we're, we're that's a direction we're moving to. We also felt that we had to, uh, and this was really the academic working group, um, uh, to manage student expectations around this because of the, the quality of some of the transcripts actually. We've, uh, we've provided guidance on, on how to use transcripts, how how tell them that it's not edited, not to use them as a single source of truth and to contact a lecturer if there's something untoward. We've just had a I don't know what you would call it. It's, I've had a letter, a, an email from academics signed by <laughs> quite a lot of academics actually, um, complaining about that some of the um, some of the auto transcripts are given terminology that some might find offensive, and what what should we do about that? I, I'm not quite sure what the answer to that is, and that's that's something that's on my agenda for 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 next week. And um, we also the columns that uh, remember that peak um, on the that one there, yeah, that there, that's this, when we did the student comms and, and we invited the students to come to the website and we were trying to raise awareness there of the, uh, that the, they can get alternative formats because that doesn't seem to be very well known, but now we've got Blackboard Dialy, it's pretty straightforward for them for them to get those and they, of course they can use it uh, in, the, in their learning any way they want, it's not really just for, you know, it's not for people with disabilities, just for people with disabilities, whatever. And um, we also, we're also beginning to think here is, is we really need to start thinking about how to uh, introduce students about how they make their own content accessible so when they're submitting work how accessible is that work and, and we really have probably a duty of care um, to, to put that into part, part of the curriculum even um, and I might even go as far as to say as they might get a, a few marks for um, having accessible content that's, I think that's something that we really should seriously be considering um, because they're, they're going to go into the world and some of them, maybe not all of them, but certainly, you know, some of them are going to need to be able to produce accessible content. Um, so, really end now. Um, this is a, a maturity model. Everybody likes a maturity model, eh? And um, this was produced by uh, uh, the mighty Alistair McNaught Consultant and AbilityNet. And um, what's interesting about it is, is that well, for us anyway, we're between three and four on this maturity model. I can't say with my hand and my heart, all our systems are built to WCAG 2.1 AA, but certainly that's the intention. And certainly that's much more widely known among the developers and the people that are providing those services that that's what it should be. Um, and that's certainly something that we're working towards. And we're, we're beginning to see staff using digital resources to maximize learning independence. So that things like Blackboard Ally and all that are beginning to, to make that work. And you can see that the, the website's getting a lot of traffic as well. Um, where we want to get to is, is definitely number five. And this is something I've been, I've been trying to do in, in my, my work life for a long time, is to get to, to a co-design. And as a matter of fact, um, we, we provide the user experience testing as a service here. At, Part of that now is, is we, we will test everything with students with disability. We have a pool of students that, that we use for that, but that's obviously um, not obviously, but that certainly tends to happen towards the end of processes rather than the beginning. And we need to uh, learn here how to, to start applying that sort of thing a lot a lot earlier. Um, so just to, to summarize, we've been we're talking about an attitude here rather than, you know, you, you saw all the things that we're doing in terms of actually complying with the, the WCAG 2.1, and that's really where we want to get to. But people who are doing that don't really need to know. And the, the, the important thing here is, is that anybody that has a difficulty can get help. That's really the important thing. All this other stuff about technology and platforms and all that, 
I'm not so concerned about that. As long as there's a route in to any of these services where someone can get help if they need it, then that seems to me that's where we ought to, to be going here. Because when you, when you work with people with disabilities, it's, it's, it's very often, it's not how you imagine it to be, is it? It's always very different. Um, and what, what we're doing here is, is to try and be inclusive and, and shifting away from the kind of one size fits all sort of attitude or the we have average users, you know, and then building for the 80 percent and all that stuff, which, you know, you would have heard me talking about a couple of years ago. That's what I would be saying that we would do. So it's about evolving that thinking, I think, uh, so that as many people as possible can get into creating a variety of ways that people can engage. Um, what's What's different here, I think, than, than maybe some of the other places that I've certainly been been speaking to is, is the the attitude. That attitude exists in buckets here. That this desire to make things as inclusive as possible is I, I've been pushing at an open door for a lot of this stuff. Obviously, you know, with some challenges, but people here genuinely want to be inclusive, and I think that's that's where we've done so well. That's why th this has happened here for us. It's because people want to do it. It was taken very seriously. We have a whole whole communities of people who want to do the best that they can for us. So, and there we are, little pithy statement, accessible content is better content. And that's, I think it's, it's one of the things I'm often I have to remind people is, is this isn't just about people with disabilities, that if we make our content accessible, it's better for everybody. And, uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure many of you already understand that. Um, so that's all I've got to say. That was just a, a whistle stop tour um, of, of what we'll be doing. I was going to do a next step slide, but then I decided, do you know what, that's only really interesting to me. The next steps is, is to, as I was saying earlier, is to try to try to embed this in as business as usual. There's certainly lots of room for improvement in practically every area that we've been working on. It's how can we make this just as part of the, of the things that we're doing? So I'm happy to try and answer any questions if, if anyone has anything to say. Okay, uh, brilliant, Drew. Uh, we do have time um, just for uh, a few questions uh, for this recorded portion. So if anyone has a, a question, yeah. feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Um, as they do, Drew, I, I have one quick question. I know that University of Glasgow, unlike other institutions, actually employed uh, a UX officer Cat yeah. previously, um, yeah. and and she had presented for us before in the the Scottish Middle User Group. I was just wondering, did that make a difference in terms of accessibility and creating that culture of accessibility at the university? So I was I was Cat's line manager, and and I was I was the one that wanted to have UX and as a as a thing, um, and uh, it's difficult to say whether that's helped. It certainly helped me. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, as, as you might know, Cat's moved on, um, but we, we, we did get a, a successor to Cat who started on the 1st of July. And to say that, um, it's a person called Kelly Armstein, in case you come across her, to say that she got thrown in at the deep end is an understatement. And um, because, of course, we had the, the flip to online as well to try to take into account. But certainly, um, what was interesting, and I'm sure you, you, you heard this from Cat as well, we began to treat Moodle or VLE as if it was a website and therefore we could, it's, it's not, but it's very similar. Um, therefore, we could apply all the techniques you could apply to a website to, to Moodle. And, um, I, and I remember saying to Kat actually that, you know, we really need to get our academic rigor up a little bit here. If we're going to be engaging with academics, they're going to go, well, that isn't proper research and all of that sort of stuff. But actually, they loved it. They, they loved UX research. Oh, my God, they couldn't get enough of it. In fact, we had more work than we knew what to do with. So, yeah, I think it probably did help. But I think it, it's, it's, it's really that attitude that's there underneath all this, that, that, that they like it because it makes things better for the students. Um, okay, so one final question for me. What if, if you had advice to pass on about people encouraging the sense of, of culture towards accessibility, people open to the idea, designing for inclusivity um, from the beginning, what, what's, what's one piece of advice you'd like to pass on? Mm, I think you need to find the people that are interested in that and work with them. Um, We've got lots of them here. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't really an issue. But I've certainly been speaking to quite a lot of other people, and then, you know, some of them were like, uh, 
like a, a, a rebel outpost trying to uh, bring accessibility into into the, the various institutions. So yeah, I think I think that that's is that there are people out there who want to do this and, and find those ones and, and just start doing that. Um, and and try to get I mean I think I think I was very fortunate here and that, that I got management buy in right from the start. Um, and there was no there was no complicated explanations had to be given. Brilliant advice. And um, I'm, I'm sure we'll come back in 2021, in September, when that mobile deadline comes up and see how you go on from there. But um, for those of you joining um, via YouTube and, and the recording, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Thanks for, for, for taking the time to, to listen and for everyone here joining today. So um, until the next time we meet, stay safe.